Uh, third up is Josh Lerner, who is the Executive Director of the Participatory Budgeting Project. Josh will tell you more about participatory budgeting, though I think um, most people here would score pretty well on a quiz about it, um, so he'll be taking us into a deeper understanding. Um, Josh has a PhD in politics from the New School and a degree from the University of Toronto and is author of the 2014 book, Making Democracy Fun, How Game Design Can Empower Citizens and Transform Politics. Josh. Great, thanks, Peter, um, and I'm thrilled to be here tonight. So as Peter mentioned, I'm executive director of a nonprofit organization called the Participatory Budgeting Project, and we empower people across North America to decide together how to spend public money, to so bring people together in meetings uh, to brainstorm ideas, whether they like to spend money in their neighborhood, turn them into projects, and then have a public vote to decide on what gets funded. Uh, some of you who are in Boston might have had some experience with the Boston project we did this year with youth, but also been working in New York, Chicago, California, Canada, a bunch of places. Um, I'm actually not going to talk about participatory budgeting at all, though. Uh, so tomorrow you'll get to, do, to, to hear more about that if you come to the ICMA uh, session. So a soft plug for that for those who haven't signed up for it. And you can still sign up. And we're actually doing a, um, uh, a demo exercise as well. So you'll, I'll talk about it, but also you actually do participatory budgeting tomorrow in the workshop if you come out to that. Uh, if you don't come out to that, you can also hunt me down later. I'm glad to talk about it more. But in addition to the work on predatory budgeting, I'm also a, a recovering academic or, or, or pracademic, uh, um, which I like that term a lot. And I'll be talking more about some of my, my academic uh, work from my PhD and um, especially my, my book, uh, Making Democracy Fun. It's up here. So I know we're talking a lot about how to make democracy work at this, uh, this gathering. I want to talk about how to make it fun and uh, how making it fun can actually make it work. So a bit of a PowerPoint, but it's mostly as pictures. And mainly what I want to do, actually, is stay by the podium and talk into the mic. But besides that, uh, I wanted to tell a story from the book um, to illustrate some broader points. And I, I think stories are one of the main ways that I learn, I think that a lot of us learn. And so I want to take a trip to Argentina. Many of you probably took a visceral uh, trip to Argentina watching the World Cup. How many folks watched the World Cup? OK. Pretty much everyone. So I did as well. It wasn't a great afternoon, I'll admit. <laughs> uh, I was going for Argentina. But I want to talk about a uh, participatory redevelopment program down there um, and what that can teach us. And, and the program, after the first round of public meetings, uh, the staff got chased out of the neighborhood and stabbed. And so I want to talk about what that tells us about fun and how we can make democracy fun. It's probably pretty obvious, but I'll spell it out a bit. So the program is, is based in Rosario, Argentina. So Rosario is a city of around a million people. Uh, it's on the river, strong working class industrial base, very strong social movements, progressive government. Um, so kind of like the San Francisco of Argentina, but with a, a lot more stake. Um, and there's also, for, for those of you who are watching the World Cup, uh, it's actually the home of Messi. So this is where Messi grew up, so his hometown. He was shipped away to the soccer camp, I think, when he was 14, but still goes back and visits. And in the city, the, uh, like many cities in Latin America, there's a lot of shanty towns. Uh, they're called Villas, uh, Villas Miserias in Argentina. And they look like this, if, for those of you who can see it. Uh, I'll describe it a bit too, but, you know, um, a lot of um, migrants and um, both from outside the country and inside the country flocking to the cities, living in shacks made out of scrap metal, cardboard, scraps of wood, uh, no paved streets, no reliable water or sewage, um, electricity connections, very violent areas. Uh, people don't own uh, the land. And they're just plopped down amongst the city. And there's a lot of programs throughout Latin America to deal with these. And, the city of Rosario, being this progressive uh, city, wanted to try something different and try a participatory approach um, to fixing up the shanty towns. So they started a program called Rosario Habitat, and the, the basic goal was to turn those shanty towns into um, actual neighborhoods with the basic amenities that you'd expect from a, a neighborhood. And the, one of the main ways of doing that was to install some streets so then they could put in basic infrastructure. So you can't really put in water systems or sewage into a, mad, uh, a crazy jumble of, of um, shacks. And so you can see, for those of you can see on the map, there's a little map here where they basically 
um, if I can point here. Uh, you probably can't say anyway. They, the highlighted area there is the old shanty town, just lots of very small plots of land and small shacks. And the city uh, proposed putting in some new streets in there, so they'd be able to install those basic, basic infrastructure. And they organized a series of neighborhood meetings. This is one of the many shanty towns in, in the city. They organized a bunch of meetings, brought out the residents, talked about the, how they would put in this new uh, infrastructure, uh, presented the plans, um, and people seemed on board. People actually physically signed on these new plans, uh, the new land use maps that would show where the streets went. And everything was going smoothly. Staff uh, then went in to help folks move out because some of the families left to move to accommodate the new streets that would go in. And um, the family said, no, uh, we're not moving. And the staff kept pushing, and um, they got pushed back and got chased out and stabbed. And um, so they decided they probably should try something new. So what they did is they redesigned the program um, both around games and also like a game. And they brought in some participatory planners from Mexico and elsewhere. And I'd like to tell you a bit how the program worked and then what that can tell us about civic engagement and democracy more broadly. They started out the, the second revision bringing folks together in a room like this, a uh, bit more rundown, to be honest, but with small tables. And residents seat around tables, and they plop down a bag in each table, ask folks to empty it out. And there are a bunch of puzzle pieces in the bag. And looking they look kind of like neighborhood scenes, typical things you see in a shanty town. So a bunch of feral cats, you know, neighbors fighting over a big pile of trash, things like that. And the facilitators, woman Lucia, asked people to put together the puzzle, um, but without talking. And so people tried putting the puzzle together and spent a few minutes and, and just couldn't get it. And they were really frustrated. So she said, OK, round two, um, now you can, you can talk with each other. And people started talking at their tables, still couldn't put the puzzle together. And she said, OK, round three, now you can talk with folks at other tables, which wasn't actually against the rules, just no one had thought of it. And people got up, went to their tables, and quickly saw that each table had a missing piece from the other tables. And they managed to get the pieces together put together the puzzles uh, very shortly. She asked, you know, what does this have to do with uh, redeveloping your shanty town? And people actually got it pretty quickly that, you know, we have to work together if we're going to get this done. It's about the whole community. It's not just about me. It really changed the mood from one of, of largely violence, to be honest, <laughs> uh, to a much more collaborative spirit. So that was a game. Um, but what I found more interesting, actually, is how they redesigned a lot of the decision making and actually the democratic process itself to be more like a game using game design. And so the next round of workshops was uh, participatory rulemaking workshops, where they actually wrote the rules of the program. So they started out with some fixed rules, things that were technical, uh, that were actually as much privileges as rules. So for example, anyone who would have to leave the shanty town would get new housing built by the city for free and titled to the land. So it's a rule. It's also pretty cool. Uh, each plot of land would have to be at least 90 meters squared, so there would be basic living conditions. So these are technical things that limit what people could do, but also are very valuable for the program. But then there's the question of if uh, there's limited space, some folks have to move. And who moves? Who gets priority over the land? And they basically ask people to decide that themselves first by deciding on criteria. So how are we going to evaluate who has first dibs on a plot of land? And people came up with a whole bunch of criteria. So for example, if you have a job nearby, if you grew up there, if you have a disability, if you're a single parent, and they put them up on the wall. And then in these small workshops, people rank ordered them. And they developed a ranking of the group um, of the criteria they would use collectively to decide who would stay and who would go and, and who would get what plot of land. The next step uh, was to actually basically lay out a new land use plan for the shanty town. And they did this by adapting um, kind of the game Tetris, which I imagine most folks know, where you fit together different rectangles and L's and lines, different colors, and try and match them up. And they did this with a map. So they cut out these colored transparency pieces in different shapes. Each one of them represented the plot of land, 90 meters square. And they had the map of the, this block and asked people to rearrange the pieces uh, so that they would fit and decide who would get what lot of land. So people were actually doing uh, zoning <laughs> using Tetris uh, through this. And it was for real. This wasn't advisory. This is deciding on the actual land use plan for the, the block. Um, so you could see people playing out the pieces, trying to get them to fit in. This usually took a few months, actually, laying out different arrangements, going back, talking with their family or their neighbors. Um, and then 
Um, ideally, this is the outcome, but not always. And so the, the last workshop that I went to actually for one of the, uh, these workshops, they're called Loteo workshops, basically allocating lots of land. It was actually after another, another shooting, so even though things were going better, it's still a very violent area, so there have been a couple um, shootings and then actually robberies at gunpoint of staff um, for the program, so people came into the offices, held them up at their desk, um, and then went back across the street. And so staff were crossing back over the street now <laughs> to do this workshop, so we had to go in with an armored vehicle and some escorts. And it was still a pretty tense mood uh, at this point, as you can imagine, but they had to figure out this plan. And so I see the groups getting close to coming together with a, with a plan, and there's this, this guy there, um, Mario, this big beefy guy with a kind of, uh, ski cap on, and he's just glaring at the map. And at one point, he, he just points at it, this one spot, and, and yells out, you know, that road's on top of my house, that my house that my dad built with his bare hands. I've lived there my whole life. You can see there's a skull tattoo in his hand. He's just like uh, furious. Um, I didn't know what was going to happen. I started kind of inching towards the door a bit. Uh, the facilitators were looking at each other. They didn't know what was going to happen either. And um, that's when the most amazing thing did happen, where the facilitators didn't say anything, actually. One of his neighbors stood up and said, whoa, whoa, whoa. the only reason that you're moving is because of the rules we agreed on together. Um, you're getting a new house, uh, actually, that you'll get to decide where it is. It'll, you'll get title to the land. Um, and we need this road so the rest of us can have water and can have sewage and can have our own land. Other neighbors chimed in. Um, he was still angry. He wasn't happy by any means. And he said to staff, you know, look, go back to the planning department, see if you can change where this road is. But if you can't, I'll move. And so uh, on one hand, this enabled the group, which started out with um, stabbings, to get to a new land use plan that they decided on together. Uh, and this is replicated across the city. And you can see this is an image of how it looked in the end. And I don't know if folks can see this very well, but um, it's a big transformation of the neighborhood. So the, there's a kind of before and after picture up there, before the one I showed you before. Afterwards, there are paved streets, there's electricity, there are modest but stable houses, uh, and a really fundamental change in people's basic living conditions developed through a democratic process that they built themselves. So on one hand, that's just amazing in, in itself and inspiring. Uh, what's more interesting to me is what it teaches us about everything else we do and how we can rethink democracy and rethink civic engagement uh, to be something people actually might want to do in their free time and not as a civic chore. And that I could actually make it more effective. So very briefly, just to dissect what actually happened here and to draw on game design theory, not game theory, but game design theory. It's actually folks who design games, people actually play and sit down. Um, and enjoy. And a lot of my book is about how we can learn the lessons from game design and apply that to civic engagement and democracy. So they started out uh, with artificial conflict, which is at the core of any game, where you have some real conflicts, but you also try to make it more artificial. And so this um, map took this very personal conflict about land and my house and your house and displaced that onto a more neutral surface. So people were playing around with different pieces as opposed to being me against you. And that enabled them to really address and um, effectively resolve that conflict. There were rules that limited, but also enabled action. Uh, and we think of rules as limiting, but they can also be really generative um, and create a lot of, uh, of inspiring new possibilities for people. Um, and most importantly, there were measurable outcomes. So people saw that if they came out and participated, they would get new streets, new houses, electricity, running water, uh, things that really mattered, and things that are, those kind of outcomes are often missing from civic engagement. The, the for what, you know, why are we doing this? What, what's gonna come out of this? And these elements are really critical for games. You can think about soccer again, I'll be wrapping up in a minute. Um, you know, for soccer, you go onto that playing field, teams are in conflict, off the field it's a very different scenario. Rules are what make soccer interesting. If you could just pick up the ball and run into their goal, you know, that would be the most effective way of getting it to their goal. Be a, but it also would be either a boring sport or rugby, depending on your perception of rugby. <laughs> uh, it wouldn't be soccer, though. Uh, and if there was no outcome, we wouldn't probably watch people just playing around with the ball for a couple hours. And these same things are often lacking from civic engagement. And so uh, the challenge I'd put for all of you is how can we infuse some of these 
basic design elements that I think um, teach us about engagements, but from a very different perspective, how can we infuse that into our work? And recognizing that uh, even though it's making things fun, it's also very serious. Fun is a very serious and seriously effective thing that um, enables us to get a lot done. And so I hope that through the, the book um, and through this broader work and a lot of the programs do, doing this, we can think more creatively about how to redesign democracy to be more like a game. And how by doing so, if we can make democracy more fun, we can actually make it work.